basic conclusion is this. The more you pursue a spiritual right, well, those people. Merry Christmas Eve. Listen to the words from the word. This is out of Luke. Luke chapter 1. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to by Father Abraham to grant us that we, being derived from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. It's a um, prophecy from a guy named Zechariah. I've noticed in life that names are important. Um, this is a very relaxed sermon, so don't get uptight, please. Names are important, and uh, this story takes place before what we celebrate around this time of the birth of the Savior, Christmas. Christmas is... Christmas is God remembering his promise of grace. And we see that in this story that I want to share with you. The story goes like this. There's a guy named Zechariah, and there's a girl named Elizabeth. These two people were both in the family of priests. So basically... It would be like modern day for us, I don't know, preacher's kids, okay? And Zechariah becomes a preacher, and she marries the preacher. It sums it up in this. It's too much church, okay? I just want to remind you that every now and then. It's too much church. Regardless, Zechariah is about one of 8,000 priests in this time. Now, those two people, those two people prayed early on, I would assume in their teens and 20s, that God would give them a child. Have you ever prayed that? And they didn't hear a yes. They're now about 60, 65 when this story takes place. It just so happens that Zechariah is in Jerusalem, and it just so happens his division of priests were on duty. Now, every year... In a certain part of the temple, there was an altar of incense, and there was one priest that, the luck of the draw, by lot, he was able to go in there and burn the incense. It was a big privilege. Um, I think of it like the Stanley Cup. Not everyone gets to hoist the Stanley Cup. Many try, but few get there. Regardless, this guy gets picked, Zechariah. I mean, one out of 8,000, and he had to be on division. It had to be in his division at that time. He gets picked. He gets to go into this holy place. And as he's in there burning this incense, however you do that, uh, changing light bulbs, this guy, this guy sees an angel. This angel appears on the right side of the altar, and the angel does this hey, don't be afraid, moment. And this guy starts congratulating him. Okay. He starts saying, I want you to know, Zechariah, God heard your prayer. 
He's like, your wife's going to have a child. And oh, let me tell you about this child. And so he starts going on. Oh, by the way, you need to name him John. That's going to be his name. And then he continues, uh, no strong drink, no wine. He's going to have this stuff. And he's going to go before the one, the Savior. I'm just here to tell you the good news. Congratulations, Felicidades. And then the response of Zechariah is this. Uh, how will I know this? For I am advanced and my wife's advanced in years. So this whole, like, he brings out the biology, you know? It's like, this, this doesn't make sense. Now, if you've read further in this Christmas story, you know that there's a virgin. Oh, she's like 14, 15, 16. She also is approached by the same angel six months later and kind of says the same thing. She says something like, um, after being told... <laughs> God showed favor on you, dear woman, and you're going to have the Son of God. And she goes, well, how will this be? Because I'm a virgin. And so we go and we go, wow, hold on, time out. These two people have almost the exact same question, but how the angel reacts is totally different in each scenario. So just to kind of help us out, there's a difference between asking a question and questioning. The mother Mary before she was a mother, she asks a question. This guy, Zechariah, is questioning the angel. And so the angel takes a moment, and he, he kind of goes back to the beginning. Usually, when I meet someone for the first time, my name is the first thing I say. My name is Micah. And a typical response from you would be, hello, my name is Freddie. I don't know. That's at the beginning of the conversation, but not in this little quarters. Burning the incense, boom, pow, congratulations. Guy asks a question. No, he questions the angel, and the angel goes, <clears throat> let me start over. My name is Gabriel. Now, names are important. Gabriel means a hero of God. He's saying, I'm a hero of God. I stand in the presence of God. And I'm here to bring you this good news. What's he saying? I'll tell you what he's saying. He's saying this. This is who I am, and this is where I've been, and this is where I go, and this is who I run with. Who are you? Did you forget who you are? You're, you're, you're a priest. Do you, do you know who you are? Okay. Um, Let's use an example, because I think sometimes I give Zechariah no credit. Do you have a friend who is in the dating scene currently, right? There's apps for that, so I've heard. And supposedly, as you're, I don't know, corresponding with someone, uh, Eventually, one person may say, can I have your number? I don't know. I'm making part of this up. Bear with me. And they start texting, okay? And eventually, as the texting feed continues, which some of you already are like, just call the person, right? I'm with, whatever. Um, it finally gets down to someone's going to have to ask a question like that takes it beyond elevator talk, all right? So eventually, the question somebody puts in the queue, uh, types out, know, you want to go to dinner, whatever it is you do, but they don't send it. Do you ever, have you ever been in that situation? It's like, I don't care if you're 15 or if you're 55 and you're trying again. Like, for some reason, it takes guts to be vulnerable in that. So the person finally presses send, and the arrow shoots it off. And not much later, for this story, the person who receives the text starts to respond. And we have such technology now, if your phone is updated, that you can start to see that the person is responding. Have you seen the three bubbles? Are you with me? Have you ever caught yourself staring at bubbles, <laughs> just waiting for a response? Now, it doesn't have to be in the dating scene. It could be like, 
are they going to take the super swampers for $1,600 or not, right? You know, like you're, you're trying to make deals. But in this case, you know, this person's like, oh my gosh, she's, she's, she's responding. Hey, home girl, it better be good. I mean, this is like the, your one response dictates the next 50 years of my life. Are, are you with me on this? Okay, so like our brains go so many places in these moments. And then there's this thing called ghosting, right? <laughs> When the angel, Gabriel, the hero of God, says, congratulations, and he sets the stage of what this child is going to be, you're going to name him John, it's almost as if, in my mind now, when Zechariah asks this question, when he questions this hero of God, here's what he's saying. He's saying, man, I gave up on that prayer a long time ago, bub. Are you with me? You, me, a little bit of applications. I, there's some prayers that I've prayed. I don't even remember what they were. That's kind of sad. That God actually, later on in my life, might answer. And my response might be, man, I, I, I gave up on that prayer a long, long time ago, bub. And so what does the angel do? The angel says this. Yeah, you're going to need a little more persuasion, aren't you? And so he puts away the party favors, and he says, let me tell you who I am. Let me tell you where I've been. And let me remind you who you are. And I'm going to remind you by giving you a limp. There's so many parts of this story that feed back to Old Testament, um, the origin story. The limp comes from a man named Jacob. When Jacob, he wrestles with God in this moment, and um, he gets a name change because Jacob means like crafty, sly dog. And um, his name turns to Israel, which means like God fights. And he also gets a touch from perhaps God himself. And his hip is touched, and now he has a constant limp. And the constant limp is a reminder for anyone who sees this cat to say, oh, yeah, look at that, God fights. It's a reminder to remind this person who he wrestled with, where he's been, and now he's changed, and here's where he's going. And Zechariah, his story is a lot like this where the angel says, you're going to need some help with this. Your tongue is going to hit the roof of your mouth, and it won't drop until all these things that I've told you will happen. And immediately, his tongue hits the roof of his mouth, and he can't talk. I had a friend. His name is Mark White. I respect that man a lot. And he said this. He says, everyone walks with a limp. Everyone walks with a limp. You already understand it, right? Something that you have, and if you don't have a limp yet, you will have one. It's not always physical. Sometimes it's the, you know, you went through something deep, and uh, you, sometimes we come out the other side, and sometimes we don't. Regardless, when that type of person walks into the room, given enough time, you can spot people with limps. You can spot people like, man, they are weathered, aren't they? Or you're like, wow, I know that person's story, and I know that happened to them. How in the world do they have, how, how do they still have that energy? Where do they get that from? The questions start to arise. So this angel says, you're going to have a limp, paraphrase. And then the angel leaves. And all the people who are outside praying as this guy's burning incense, when Zechariah comes out, they're asking questions, and he's not able to talk. And so he starts doing signs, you know, to try to tell them what's going on, and they finally figure out, whoa, he saw a vision. Now, it had been like roughly 400 years since ever anyone heard a word from the Lord, at least from what I've gathered. 
400 years. And then this guy in his 60s just so happens to get a moment with an angel, a vision, and everyone has got to be in on it now because God finally spoke after all this silence. This guy's a celebrity. Ah. So after everything calms down, he finally finishes up his duties and he goes home. And it, the story continues and it kind of shows us that um, Zechariah started to take it serious. So he does his part, his wife gets pregnant, and then that's where you get, six months later, a reunion between Elizabeth and her cousin named Mary. Mary has a baby in her belly, and so does Elizabeth at the same time. Fast forward. Nine months come around, or so, and a baby is born, and his name is John. But you don't name the baby, I guess, in that culture, the day it's born. You name it like eight days later. Because in that culture, you go to the temple. Why eight days later? I heard one time, and check me on this, but I heard that you circumcise a baby eight days later because a vitamin K is at the highest point and blood clotting. And whether it's true or not, for some reason, they waited eight days, and here now, in the temple, the babies, and I can only imagine, um, as you have everyone around, are they watching this? Whatever the case. Now, people start to go, hey, what's his name? His name's Zechariah, right? Like, that, his name's Zechariah. It's got to be Zechariah. Like all this family and everybody's celebrating. And I mean, we just had this moment where it's like these people, they don't have a child. They're in their 60s. Disgrace because in that culture. And then here now, what in the world? How is this happening? Whoa. And the baby comes. It's like, whoa. And she also, for five months, hid herself. And I want to take a moment on that. I think some of the part of why she hid herself was because um, some of you know what it's like uh, to like, you know, you're going to have a baby and then uh, something happens to the baby. So I, I wonder if she kind of just kept things quiet because there's still that, this is new, we want to be careful and we don't want to, R regardless, they have this baby and Everyone's asking, what are you going to name the child? It's Zechariah, right? And Mama Liz says, no. His name is John. And I mean, the family's like, what? What do you mean his name is John? It can't be John. No one in your family's name is John. It's got to be Zechariah. Hey, Zach, what do you think? And then they start signing to Zechariah, which I thought he was the only one that's mute at this time. But regardless, they start doing signs and asking him, what's his name? And then Zechariah gets out his big pen and he writes on a tablet and he says, his name is John. And immediately his tongue fell off the roof of his mouth and he was able to speak and he starts to bless God. And everyone in that moment had some fear, and they started to take the story, and they went out to the highways and the byways and the lowly places and the upper places, and they started to tell what had happened. And then everyone started to question, what, what in the world could this baby be? Surely God, the Holy One, is with him. And in that moment of pure joy, and also relief that now you can talk again. Zechariah speaks. And that's where we get this prophecy. And in the prophecy, he pins out key points. There's key points in it. And the three flavors that I want to pull out are this. That God remembers... God remembers his promise, and also that God remembers his promise of grace. So I want to read that little bit with you one more time. I won't read the whole prophecy, but this is right after the guy finally um, decided 
to fully obey God. Now, no time. Here it is. Um, Blessed be the Lord, God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets from of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child will be called prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercies of our God. Oh. Uh, So names are important. And um, when you look at the name uh, Zechariah, it means God remembers. And I don't think that's coincidence. That this guy even though he's been serving God for so long and that he stayed steady. And, 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 and God's view of Zechariah was of, of upright and his view of, of Elizabeth was uh, respect that God saw these two and they obeyed his commandments and he was giving them the thumbs up, but they lived in a culture where you don't have a child and that means because you got to, one, have purpose in life and it's bearing children. And the second thing is you have to have someone to follow your name and so in a sense you name them after your, you keep the family line going and then they receive this vision and they receive the child and then this guy is to a point He's different. It has been my joy. It has been my joy to get to know some of you. But um, probably for the past 10 years, time after time after time, I get to meet people who are a little bit older than me, you know, like 60, 70, 80, 90. And I get to see people where they um, aren't who they used to be. In fact, sometimes I talk to people who used to know them back in their 20s and 30s, and they say, oh, man, uh, that, that Steve guy, you didn't ever want to be around him. He was, and they start to share stories about back in the, well, that's not who Steve is anymore. And I have got to see people who have been sweet, that they have no longer been bitter, but they're better. These people who are you, you, used to be where they had just swear you out left and right and wouldn't give a... Now, they're some of the most tender human beings. And sometimes the whole point and the reason why they get to that is because when God grabs them, he gives them a limp. He gives them a moment, a time, a season where they're no longer the strong, independent, whatever. But now they aren't just doing things through the motions, but they're doing things because they finally had an encounter with the true God. And sometimes God sends his heroes to pull that out of us. I don't think it's a coincidence that Zechariah's name is God remembers. God remembers his prayers. And I don't think that it's coincidence that uh, Elizabeth's name means God's, God, God's promise. Um, a, a, a woman who everything in her culture is you do this and that means that God has favor with you. And this doesn't happen to you, then that means that God must not have favor with you. And that it goes way bigger than Elizabeth's story that the whole idea of God's promise and his oath is in the prophecy of Zechariah, and it goes way back to people who weren't going to have kids, and their names were Abraham and Sarai, and they have a child whose name is Laughter, and it goes way back, the promise, all the way to the garden, where God says, I'm going to send one who's going to save the world, and guess what, O serpent? You're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And now the time is where God finally says, it's about to go down. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the name John means God is gracious. So it's like somebody said, you put those three names together and you have God remembers, 
God remembers his promise. God remembers his promise of grace. Now, some of us would say, oh, that's just coincidence. No, I think God likes to work in the subtle ways and even through literature. So as we take the cup that represents the body of the Christ, as we take um, in the cup the juice that represents his blood, bread and wine, uh, I also want us to remember of what took place before and what took place during and what's getting ready to take place. That God makes a promise and God remembers. That God hears the prayers and the cries of his people and I'll tell you what, eventually he does answer. And also God will answer later on in that. So here's the last thought. God remembers this promise of grace. When it comes to Zechariah, it's way more than Zechariah and Elizabeth. It's the whole nation. God coming to save. And for you and I, in this year, Christmas season, 2023, um, there are times and moments, and this may not be everyone in here right now, but some of you maybe so, where we wonder, um, God, are you ever going to right the wrongs? Are you ever going to make this better? And it can be individually, but it's way bigger than that. It's like, it's, it's, it's global. God, when are, when are you going to come back and, and, and make things better? And uh, I think the point isn't that God does it in our timing. I think the whole, the whole scheme of it is that um, we continue to burn the incense in our lives, but that we don't just burn the incense in the whole serving thing because this is what we do, what we do, but that we take the limps of life and um, hit us to the point where when we prophesy, when we speak of things to come one day in the future that we've been told, when Jesus is going to return, he's going to make all things new, we don't say them as something that, oh, yeah, you know, that, that's going to happen. No, that we're, we actually believe it, like Zechariah finally turns in his life, and he says, you, oh child, you are going to be the, the, the chief executive of marketing um, for the champion to come. And for you and me, to a point, we are those representatives of marketing uh, for when Jesus one day will return. And I don't think in life that there is any greater honor. So as we take the cup, uh, will we remember why we have that purpose in life? That there was one that was born for the whole purpose to die, for the whole purpose to raise, so that you and I could one day, we could pray for him to save our lives, okay? Let's pray. Our Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his goodness, uh, that he didn't waver in that. Uh, he did something that I couldn't do. And thank you, Lord, that um, you work in subtle ways, and that um, if we look just a little further, we can see... We can see it pop off the page. Uh, let us remember that you, when you make a promise, you keep it. And that um, you, are, you are going to return. And you are going to make new out of old. Until then, Lord, um, whatever season, time, place that we are in, help us never to forget that... Um, we get the greatest honor if we're a Christian uh, to be the foregoers before the Savior returns. Uh, Lord, we long to wait for our champion to come back. Until then, Lord, help us to constantly remember who he is and um, never to forget who we are. In Jesus' name.